something like the fourth bullet point, I think. We'll see. Uh, so certainly, my st I stand here and don't move. It's a totally legal uh, cycle in your graph. If you just well, you just start where you end because you don't move at all. Um, the, the same. So I, I really don't care. In general, those things can can do whatever they want. Just really crazy. They just need to end where they start. They can miss edges. They can miss vertices. They can take edges several times. They can take vertices several times. Um, it, it really, it really is just a general note. But the crucial ones will be the reduced ones, of course. We'll see that uh, in a second. And the difference between a general pass and a cycle is that a pass was essentially a graph homomorphism from the pass graph into your given graph. And a cycle is the same, but for the cyclic graph. Right? That's exactly what it is. It's a cyclic graph uh, so that you somehow map into your uh, graph G. So this is G and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is cyclic seven. That would be a pass of length seven that sits somewhere in my G. And it, it can really map very, very crazily into G. Um, and li like this, it could be really, really crazy. Um, so here, for example, this would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So there would be a map from C6 into this graph given by, well, just tracking along the red line. Right, so a pass in general is a map from the pass graph and a, a cycle is a map from the cycle graph. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, like uh, in this diagram, you did not set the point of view with the x. You did not have the start and end of the pass. But like from my point of view, can I say that the, the, uh, the node number two can be the node at the start and end of, of the pass also? Um, formally speaking, the pass is defined as having a start point and a collection of, of vertices. But obviously, they are the same pass, just as a cyclic permutation along the pass. So, so, so they are all the same? They, they will, we will count them as the same. But for, like with graph isomorphisms, formally, they are not the same because I've picked a specific set, and I just track it. So, um, but certainly, in, in some sense, because it lives on the cycle, that's your question, there is really no good start or end point anyway. So they will be all the same. And even in some sense, I just edit the orientation to be able to say I'm going around in some way. But actually, it's just the cycle itself. And it could go, but you could think of it going in both ways. Again, on the cycle, there is, or on, a, on a circle, there is no preferred choice of, well, there's counterclockwise and clockwise, but there's no preferred choice. All the same. Okay. Thank you very much. You see that in this definition, because I don't really care about orientation of my C7 or something. And well, there are those inefficient cycles, Upala, which just is, well, you could have something like this, and then you go around, and it's just a very silly operation. So you could go a loop and then go around, and you kind of can shorten it. Or you can do something like, um, yeah, let's say you actually want to trace just a triangle, but your pass or your, your cycle does this and then traces a triangle. Right, it goes around. That's inefficient. And we want to kind of have the minimal ones. Um, and we will call them reduced. So the triangle itself will be a, it, it, it is a cyclic graph. It's, it's a reduced pass. And this funny thing with the loop is not reduced. And the, the cool fact is actually that this funny notion of Euler characteristic, which we had last time, was a little bit unmotivated. It, it really comes in here really beautifully, and it kind of picks out the, the, the cycles in the graph, the possible cycles, in, in a really, really great way. We'll see that, the, the reduced ones. OK. So um, and the notion I would like to use here is uh, contractible, and contractible is just collection of edges uh, of repeated edges. So this means somewhere in your graph, you have, let me give this edge a name, uh, E and E prime. You have an E. Uh, somewhere in your cycle, you have an E and an E prime. And it's really just this operation of just doing a, a silly loop somewhere. 
um, and we call a, a cycle contractible if it contains some of those. Um, but the crucial notion, we call it reduced if it's not contractible, which is really just, so again, this guy is reduced. I could have an extra vertex here, which I don't touch. So maybe let's make the graph uh, red and the path blue. So this is G, uh, sorry, and the cycle blue, and this is C. Um, so this is reduced, but this one, for example, that goes around like this is not reduced. So this one is good, and this one is not good. Uh, this kind of is already encoded in the other one. So that's why we kind of don't want them. We want kind of the minimal um, possible kind of graphs, a uh, pass. Yeah, absolutely. I can go back. So contractable if it contains one of those guys. I could contract them. Uh, let's say I start here, I could contract them. That's the definition. So it has a repeated pair of edges which just go, go back and forth. And if you do that repeatedly, so you start with something, you repeatedly get rid of those, um, uh, but you de delete those repeated edges, you will eventually end with a reduced one. Yeah? Everything is finite, you just look at your path, and you get rid of those repeatedly, and you'll end with some kind of the, the reduced form of your, your path. We'll have several examples in a second. Um, the reduced ones are exactly the ones that only visit the vertices and edges they need to, and they do not, they do not have any stupid uh, going back and forth operations, which obviously doesn't get us anywhere, right? If you go back and forth, I just uh, end where I started. It doesn't get me anywhere. So the operation I just did is the same as staying just fixed on one point. Um, and the point is that the reduced ones are really isomorphic. They track back the cyclic graph somewhere. Um, uh, sorry, not isomorphic. They could be something strange like, um, uh, sorry, this one was misplaced. So let's say this is our graph. And here's a non-reduced cycle, which is, not a, not, not a, uh, uh, which is not of this form. So a reduced one. So this is reduced. I can't get rid of anything, right? It does exactly what it needs to. It goes around the whole graph, and there's no way to reduce it. Um, but since I hit this vertex twice, it's more like, well, I call it the figure eight, the figure eight graph. It's more like the figure eight graph instead of the, the cyclic graph. So it's a bit tricky, but in, sense, in some sense, we could think of um, as the reduced ones as being a concatenation of those cyclic ones. Kind of a lot of cyclic graphs in your uh, big parent graph. Okay. We'll see in a second why this notion is really cool. Um, and the, the notion I would like to address here is the notion of a tree, which are kind of the easiest possible graphs you can think of, and they already form a, a non trivial and very nice uh, family. And I could just call it. Uh, well, the, the only path I, 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 that is not trivial, the reduced one, is a stupid, I stand here, everything of length, and that's a bit boring. It appears in every graph. And we kind of want to have a notion to, well, we'll see. The tree will be something without cycles, but obviously since this cycle is in every graph, uh, we kind of don't want that, and we just call something non-trivial if it's non-trivial, if the length is non-trivial. Okay. And the tree, by definition, is a connected graph with no, with no cycles, with no reduced non-trivial cycles. Okay. So you, the only thing you can do in a tree, I have many more pictures of trees, trees is very important, is you can just walk somewhere, and if it's reduced, there's not much you can do. You just need to start somewhere, and you will end somewhere. You can never kind of come back unless you, you're going for a non-reduced path. So I will draw one in a second. So uh, a non-reduced one, let's say you start here, and you, at one point you get stuck. You can't get back without doing a, a silly 
getting back operation at what defines a tree. So here is the same. I, I, at one point, I get stuck. If I start here, at one point, I get stuck. Um, so I can't make them arbitrary long. And the only thing I can do in a tree, so a tree, by definition, doesn't have any cycles. So I can never go back without doing, uh, obviously, I could do reduced operations like this, and non-reduced operations just going, this was bad, <laughs> going something like back and forth and back and forth. But in the reduced sense, the only paths in a graph are just really, really paths graphs, the lines. In a tree, uh, lines. And somehow nature seems to prefer those guys. So uh, a lot of chemical objects are actually forming trees. Um, here's a bigger list of trees. Um, here's another tree, so, which we all know very well, a tournament tree. Again, there's no cycle, and there's only a kind of a unique way to go from, well, whatever, somewhere here to somewhere here, like uh, moving along in the tournament if you want. So these things really appear in nature, and they appear very often, so we would like to have a good way of, of studying them. Um, and they're really simple, kind of, they get very complicated. I have a really nice picture on the next slide. Um, so here's a list of them, up to seven vertices. So they get pretty complicated, so we'll discuss that in a second. Um, but they are still kind of the easiest class of graphs. They are cycle-free. There's no way to cycle around. As you can see, there's no way um, to cycle around unless you do a silly type operation of this form. Right? Um, here, the past graph, clearly there's no way to cycle around. You can go from uh, this whatever, left to right. In more fancy graphs, like this one here, you can do this, but then you're stuck again. At one point, you get stuck. You could do this, and you get stuck. Um, this one is a bit fancier here. You could do this, and eventually you get stuck. Right? So you can't cycle around. And um, uh, they are, you can list them. So up to isomorphism, there are 11, apparently, of every seven vertices. Uh, so th this number gr grows very, very quickly. But there is some very nice formula for the growth of graphs, uh, of trees. So they're really, really kind of a nice class of uh, graphs with kind of special properties. We'll see that in a second. And what makes them so special is the theorem which I'll show you in a second, which is a really cool, it's a really cool theorem actually, and it uh, helps a lot to work with trees. And the only notion I need to state the theorem is the notion of a leaf. I hope that makes some sense. So let's get, go back to the vertex of degree one. Let me go back to my tournament tree, and let me draw the tournament tree a little bit differently, such that it looks more like a tree. This is where the name comes from, I guess. And everything of degree one would be a leaf. So all of these upstairs guys are leaves, right? Remember, degree is just the number of adjacent uh, edges. So everything upstairs is a leaf. That's where the name comes from. Here, in those uh, graphs, all the edges are leaves, and all the seeds. So these are leaves, as you can see here, and the seeds are not. But the seeds have multiple connections, and the edges are always connected to one um, seed. Uh, let's go somewhere here. Which one do I like? Uh, for example, this one has a leaf here, a leaf here, a leaf here, a leaf here. And everything else is not a leaf because everything else is at least uh, two neighbors. In a past graph, you all know what the leaves are. Um, this one, so the outside ones, and everything else is not a leaf, obviously. And everything else has two connections. Um, let me do one more. Which one is very complicated? I have no idea. This one maybe here, here, and here and leaves were green a second ago, so they should be actually green. Ooh, come on, should be actually green. I hope the notion makes some sense. And if we just stare here at our picture, I, I could now mark all of them. I won't do that, that takes too much time. But as you can see, all of these have leaves. There's not a single tree without a leaf. And that's exactly the theorem that I would like to present. So a tree, well, there's one special case. So this, ver just one vertex without any edge is also a tree. Um, yeah, so does, that does, obviously doesn't have two leaves. 
So that's what I would like to ignore. So I ignore this case. And then any tree with at least one edge has at least two leaves. So let's check that here. Again, in our little list. So the smallest case is this one. And well, it only has leaves, so it has two leaves. Um, the biggest one here has quite a few leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six. So certainly more than two. And if you stay on it for a second, you probably will agree that all of these have at least two leaves. So it would be a good conjecture now to kind of, well, <laughs> the theorem sounds like a good conjecture, so maybe we can actually prove that. And why is that interesting? So before we go to the proof, why is that interesting? Well, so let's say I already know that my tree, uh, I have a tree, and then I know the existence of a leaf by the theorem. And for example, I could just pick a leaf that I know now, and I remove it together with its edge. And whatever remains is again a tree, right? So trees are closed under removing leaf operations. Let me try to figure out which one this is actually on the list. Um, it's this guy, I think. Um, is it one, two? Uh, no, it's not. It's, which one is it? This one is it. Give me another try. This one is it. One, two, three, yeah, it is perfect, right? So the removing leaf operation is the trees are closed under removing leaf operations, which then gives you an inductive way to prove theorems about trees, right? You just kind of check them for small examples and then kind of inductively remove a leaf. Okay, let's see whether we believe this theorem. Ah, that's what I just said, okay? So this is really just an inductive tool. And that's why in some sense trees are so simple because they're kind of inductively built. You can also think of them in the opposite order, right? They're inductively built by just putting leaves to uh, simple, uh, simpler graphs. And that's, by the way, how you construct a tournament tree, right? You just start from wherever you want to end up, and you end leaves by adding uh, new layers of your tournament, if you want. Okay, and I claim the following works. So if you take a longest reduced pass, We'll go back to the other slide in a second, and I can convince you that it works. In my uh, tree, then both endpoints are leaves. And before I go to the why, let me see whether we believe that. So I take a longest pass here, and the longest pass, the longest possible reduced pass, just goes all the way from here to here. And yeah, in this case, I hit exactly the two leaves. Maybe I go to a more fancy example. So the long, L longest pass in this graph, for example, would be this one, I think. So and the endpoints will be two leaves. And that's exactly how you find, um, here's another example, that's exactly how you find um, the two leaves. Here is the longest pass, and it has two leaves. You can already see why you can have more leaves, because this graph, the one I just did, the seven, eight, has more than one longest pass, and it will eventually find uh, if you just would list all longest paths, you will eventually find all leaves. So here's the second one. If we pick out this one and this one again. Okay, so let's convince ourselves that it actually works. Seems to work in the example. Um, and, and it's a pretty simple argument. So we have this longest path going from here to here. And if both are leaves, we are done anyway. Okay, so we can assume that one of them is not a leaf. So let's say V is not a leaf. Then there is some neighbor of V, uh, V prime maybe, because it's not a leaf, right? So it connects here to whatever, uh, Z maybe next in this path, um, in the longest reduced path. But since it's not of degree one, it's not a leaf, it has some other neighbor, V prime, that sits um, somewhere. Let's say it sits somewhere on the left. And it can't be part of the path. Why can't it be part of the path? Well, if it would be part of the path, let's say it would sit here, then we would have actually created a, a circle. And we just assume that we don't have a circle. Okay, so it doesn't sit here, so this edge is wrong. But it really sits here, but now the, 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 our longest pass actually gets longer, so we arrive at a contradiction. So really, it doesn't work. So I just assumed that, well, one of them is not a leaf, and it arrived at contradiction because I could make it longer using one of the extra edges of a leaf. Hope that makes some sense. Okay, this is 
a really nice statement, again, I say it again, because it now gives us a tool to inductively prove theorems about trees. And I'll show you one in a second, where we just apply this strategy. OK, so here's one. So the Euler characteristic of a tree is 1. OK, um, we'll go back to the other slide in a second to convince ourselves that this is true. But maybe we look first. All that characteristic, remember, was the number of vertices minus the number of edges. And if you assume that the number of vertices is n, then apparently the number of vertices in any tree needs to be n minus 1 for this equation to work out. Let's just convince ourselves that it actually works. Uh, I haven't done this one, for example. We already knew, for, uh, checked last time for the past graphs that they have n vertices and n minus 1 edges. But for a fancy tree like this one, let me just do the count. So it apparently has six vertices. Otherwise, the slide here would be wrong. And it has one, two, three, four, five edges. So this actually works. Seven and one, two, three, four, five, six edges. That's pretty, um, it's kind of a miracle in some sense, right? So this seems to be really, really simple in some form. So here are certainly six edges and seven vertices. All that characteristic seven minus six is one. So let's, it's kind of a fun way, right? The Euler characteristic kind of picks out trees as well. So let's see how we can prove that. And it's very, very simple. So I actually spell out too many details in some sense. So here's the idea. It's an induction proof, and you just check it for whatever, the smallest possible example. Uh, obviously, it's true for something like this. OK, fine, good, works. And then what you do is you have your fancy tree somewhere. Could be, I don't know, this is not a very fancy tree, but anyway, whatever. Just pick a leaf. We know that a leaf exists. And we remove it together with its edge. Right? We just get rid of this whole pair. And in, by induction, we get that whatever remains has all that characteristic one. But what have we removed? We have removed one vertex and one edge. So the all that characteristic, which is just vertices minus edges, doesn't see this removal anyway, so we can edit again, and the Euler characteristic stays the same. Right. So Euler characteristic is invariant under removing leaf, because it's one vertex and one edge. So it makes this one one smaller, and it makes this one one smaller, which in total contributes zero. Right. This is a very simple argument if you know kind of the existence of a leaf. Just to pick it from your tree. Uh, use induction, and, and you are essentially good. OK. I hope this is pretty clear now. Let me just stress it again. We already did the count. So n is, so e is always n plus, OK. I wrote it differently. So what I write here is n is equals n minus 1 plus 1, which is, of, of, course, of course, the same. And it really just follows, because we know what the order characteristic is, right? Remember. Or that characteristic was just v minus e. Uh, oops, and this was supposed to be a minus, minus e. And if we know that this is 1, then uh, the equation uh, follows by algebra autopilot, I guess, by just putting e on the other side. And I think this is pretty cool. I mean, this is absolutely not obvious. And if you would come up with this conjecture yourself, you might, would, might like to stare on this picture for a while. And you eventually maybe hit this pattern. Like here, seven again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it should have six edges, one, two, three, four, five, six. Absolutely non-trivial. Trees get pretty crazy, as you can see. Um, but this pattern remains. And it's, it's a cool consequence of the Euler characteristic argument and that the Euler characteristic is fixed under removing leaves. That's a cool justification of the Euler characteristic. So yesterday, I didn't really have any good justification of the Euler characteristic. But this is not so bad. This is actually not so bad. So the Euler characteristic picks out trees. And we will see in a second that it's actually a better statement. So uh, Euler characteristic is one if and only if the graph is a tree. But um, let's go on. So trees play a good role in any graph. I have a picture in a second. But the point is that whenever you have a graph, you can find a tree in your graph with the same number of vertices. 
and it's simpler and still tells you a lot about um, the, the graph itself. So let me just give you a picture first and then we can go through the proof. So here's my graph, uh, the, 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 everything is the graph G, let me put it in red because it's kind of red. And the tree I find here is the green one. And it's very much simpler, it has the same vertices, but it's much simpler, it's just um, kind of the minimal way to connect the vertices in the tree. I hope the picture makes some sense. So for any graph, you will be find, able to find a green T in the graph, the green tree. Um, and what we do is, well, let's say you have some crazy graph and you want to construct um, a tree out of it, so the graph somewhere does some crazy, crazy nonsense, who knows, uh, whatever, I don't know. And what we do is we just look for cycles and whenever we find a cycle, we remove an edge from the cycle. Um, so here, maybe I can do it live for you in this example down here. So here, for example, we have a cycle going around in this blue uh, triangle and we just can remove an edge. And because it's a cycle, it connects all vertices, but if I remove an edge, all vertices are still connected. So successively, I can run around here and whatever, let me do another one, maybe not this one. Um, like here is a cycle, and I can get then rid of this edge, for example, so I got rid of this edge, and there are still cycles in the graph. I keep on going, remove edges until I don't see any cycles anymore, and the operation always keeps the number of vertices in my graph the same, because that's the property of a cycle, right? The cycle starts somewhere and ends somewhere, so if I remove one vertex, it's still connected and all vertices are in my, in my uh, subgraph. And such trees are called spanning trees. There might be more than one, so certainly you can have more than one spanning tree. Um, let's do a simple example. Uh, so for example, if you have just a cycle on, so this is these three, on three vertices, I see three ways to remove an edge to make it into a tree, so it will have three of those spanning trees. So I can remove this edge and I get a tree that looks like this. I can remove this edge and I get a tree that looks like this. Or I could remove this edge and I get a tree that looks like, like this. And all of them are good. All of them are spanning trees. And very often the only thing you care about is to find one of them and you don't really care about the number of them. That's kind of the, the simplest way to connect all vertices in your graph without having too many redundant edges. It's called a spanning tree. And the proposition just says they always exist. And if something always exists and it's clearly non-trivial, right, it's not the graph itself in general, um, then it's usually a very important notion. Okay, let me show you what this implies. Um, though this was just the same as before. What we get now is this really, really cool <laughs> characterization of graphs, if you want. There's always this connectivity assumption. Um, otherwise, you have many of them and you just do it per connected component. But a connected graph has all our characteristic one, if and only if it is, it's a tree, and un, 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 uh, otherwise the uh, all our characteristic is always smaller. So let's see whether we can actually check that in my little example here. So my graph has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertices, and the tree has six edges. I will count them for you, but we already know that it is six edges. That was one of the previous propositions. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so the tree certainly has all our characteristic one. Uh, so let's, and the other one has more edges, right? Here's another one, so, uh, what is it? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the graph itself has 10, 7 minus 10 is uh, minus 3, I guess. So it's certainly not 1. It just gets lower. And we know that now. Why, can, why do we know that? Well, just pick a spanning tree in your graph. It has all our characteristic 1. And the graph itself is obtained from the spanning tree by adding edges, or the tree is, conversely, the tree is obtained by removing edges. So, um, Going from the tree to the graph, the number here increases. So E of tree is always 
smaller than number E of graph, the number of edges in the tree, while the number of vertices of the tree is always the same. So the Euler characteristic only knows one direction. It can only go downwards. Right? It can't go upwards, so it can only go downwards. The graph itself has more edges, so the Euler characteristic goes towards minus infinity. And this is pretty cool. This is really cool justification of the Euler characteristic. Um, it picks out trees on spot on. So it, 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 the Euler characteristic is one if and only if your graph is a tree. It's a pretty, pretty cute statement. Um, okay, let's, let's do maybe one more example. Going back to our little, little list here. So if you would have, um, let's say here, you could fill this up with edges. So my graph G would now have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges, and clearly still five vertices. Five minus seven is uh, minus two, I guess. Um, and what I also can count here is well, it kind of has three cycles, if you want. Here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, and one minus three apparently is also minus two. So the order, if I start with the Euler characteristic of my tree, this is chi of the tree, and I subtract some of the, the new cycles added, I um, get the Euler characteristic of my graph. This is all a characteristic of G. And why is that? If you remember the proof of the theorem, this is exactly how we constructed the tree. We went in the other direction. We looked at the cycles and we broke them uh, successively. And I just did the opposite. I added the, the edges again. So you can also just start, if you want to compute all a characteristic of a graph, um, you can also just start with the graph and remove edges until you hit the tree. You just count the number, and you can easily calculate. So in this case, it would have been three, and you can easily then calculate the order characteristic by just one minus whatever you've counted. I hope that makes some sense. Okay. And this defines um, a notion which will turn out to be very important in topology. Where are we? We went through all of this. Um, there is a notion of number of independent cycles. Let me just draw the graph from before again. And it's exactly what I just said. And I will have another example on the next slide. So we had this graph here. And it was had those funny edges here. And it clearly has a huge number of cycles. Um, you could go around like crazy. But some of the most reduced ones I see, there are three of them. Um, like this guy here in green. Uh, do I have a good color? This one here in purple. And maybe orange, and this one here in orange. There are many more cycles. For example, there's the outside one. But the outside one is somehow, huh? the outside one is somehow a combination of the others. And we'll make that precise in a second. And make the sense, the outside one goes blue, 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 but blue is part of any of the others. So in some sense, the outside one is actually just a, just a combination of the other ones. And the ones that remain, and I will define on the next slide, are called the independent cycles. And their number gives you exactly uh, what you need to subtract. Or what I did before was I did one minus number of those cycles. Let me call it number of i equals chi of g. And what I wrote down here is just rearranging by just putting, swapping those. So the number of independent cycles is then, of course, one minus the order characteristic of the graph. OK. Um, and let me define what an independent cycle is. Uh, that will take us a, a second. It's a kind of a slightly strange definition, um, but we'll go for it. And then we are actually done for today. And we will study more past next week.
So um, as long as we don't have any cycles, I don't have any independent cycles. So the top graph is kind of a boring example. It's a tree, so Euler characteristic is one. It has no independent cycles. It has no cycles at all. Okay, so here I would like to have two of them. And what do I do? Well, I do the following. So I just, uh, maybe I give some slightly different names. I have the, uh, what is it? Well, uh, purple one and the red one. So the red one, let me just give this, these edges some names. Uh, X, Y, Z, uh, A and B maybe. So this, the, what is it? The red one is clearly A, B, Z, and back. And uh, what is it? The purple one is, let me see, is X, Y, Z, and back. And I could have a cycle um, going around the green one. C, and C clearly is, um, what is it? X, Y, Z, uh, sorry, not Z, A and B. B and A, if you want to fix the order. Go from X to Y to B to A. Uh, and back, oh, of course. There you go. And in some sense, and I will explain what I mean by that, when well, it's actually on the slide, but we will do it live. Um, the top and the bottom one already contain all information, or, uh, sorry, the, the top and the middle one contain all information of the green bottom one, because all of the edges are actually there. The only thing that is not, uh, that appears double, is the Z. So what we will do is we will just think of those graphs as being a collection of those vertices, uh, uh, cycles as a collection of those vertices, uh, in order with the edges A, B, and Z, and coming back to the question of how to would like to read them, I read those words cyclically, so this is the same as uh, Z, A, B, and it's the same as uh, B, Z, A, I guess. And how do I encode this property smartly? Well, here comes a cool trick. I just abstractly add them. I just say, okay, this is just A plus B plus Z. The symbol plus doesn't mean anything. It just is, uh, because it's commutative, you can just get a bit of the order here and fix out the summons. So they call this one Y, X plus Y plus Z. And this one is whatever, x plus y plus a plus b. And I claim now that the following equality holds, which is kind of, kind of a little bit of a miracle. I claim now that c plus so the, uh, the purple one plus the red one equals the green one. So let's see whether it actually works out. And you can do something similar in general. Very impressive. So let's see. So uh, here, so I have x, y, a, and b. So I have x, y, a, and b. Well, it doesn't quite work because I get twice z. So somehow here I get plus twice z. So that's why I just get rid of uh, everything that appears twice. I just get rid of it. So I take mod two coefficients if you want. Um, get rid of it. And mod two, they are actually the same. And an independent cycle is, by definition, you just take the vector space of all of the cycles over z mod 2 coefficients, and it's the basis of the vector space. Let me just make that statement here. So that's what I just did. And the dimension of this basis is um, given not by that number. That's a negative number. It's given by, uh, no, no, sorry, this is the correct number. It's given by this number. So remember that this number is very negative here. So that's whatever, minus three, for example. So one minus minus three in my example from before would be four, for example. And this works. So the Euler characteristic picks out those funny linear combinations in the graphs, which is absolutely non-trivial, right? So I'll do one more example for you. Um, not too big one. Um, so here, 
the, the obvious one is this one and this one. I could also take the green one and now I've got my colors. I don't remember my colors anymore. Okay, red and the red one and the purple one. So I could also take, let's say I like purple and I could also take uh, green and I claim purple plus green is uh, red. So let's see, I had them here. Purple plus green picks up x, y, x, y twice, so they die, right? So we have two x and two y, so they die. They go away. And I have a z, okay? And I have an a plus b, very good, and that's exactly the result I get. Kind of magic on the cycles picked out by the order characteristic. And this nonsense works in any graph, no matter how complicated it is. You just kind of, you can always find a number of independent cycles which kind of go around and pick out as few edges as possible and everything else is a linear combination of those cycles. Okay, but well, this was um, actually everything I wanted to talk about today. So let me recap what we have seen. Well, this is kind of a funny notion, so we won't see it again. So this is the beginning of what people call algebraic topology. So this observation motivated the whole story of algebraic topology, which is a huge field of mathematics nowadays. It's really a miracle that this works. But otherwise, what we have seen and we will re re uh, visit next week are mostly paths and cycles and how they, determine, how they determine structure of a graph, like being a tree or um, the order characteristic was this really, really nice way to pick out exactly the graphs that are trees, because the order characteristic always spits out one for trees. And really, the, the, the main takeaway message from today, and that's really useful in practice, is the theorem, which had a very nice proof here, um, that this class of trees is closed under uh, uh, removing leaves. So it always has two leaves, and the class of trees is then closed under removing those leaves. Okay, so next week we will continue with cycles and graphs and um, do some more fun stuff on graphs. 